So my name is John Genke, and I'm joined by my colleagues Christina and uh, Michael from Carlsruhe. <laughs> so uh, Michael Evans, he is a application scientist for X-ray diffraction. And uh, Christina Drathen, she is a uh, product manager, uh, specifically for the Iger 250. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, so if you have any questions uh, today, let's make sure to go into the stage area. So if you go to the right side of your screen, you're going to see a few different chats. Uh, the one that we want to look at is called stage. And then under there, there is an area called Q&A. So if you have any questions, please make sure to type those in. Um, otherwise, we do have quite a few questions that did come in over the last two weeks, and we'll go through those. So the Iger 2R uh, 250K, it's a really nice addition to the detector family. Uh, if you don't have that much background on it, if you haven't seen them yet, there are some very nice videos on YouTube uh, where we go through a lot of the features and specifics. Um, so to start out with, the first question we have, though, is... Actually, you know, it's one that we get quite often, is how does the Iger compare to the link side? So, who wants to take that one? That's for you, Michael. That's for me. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> right in the lab. So, yes. So, uh, how does the Iger compare to the link side? Well, the Iger is a, um, is a pixel detector while the Lynx Eye is a uh, strip detector. Um, sorry, just one second, I lost my spot. Um, so the Iger, the Iger 250K is a detector that is a, has a square sensor. It's 38 by 38 millimeters. Um, the Iger 500K is twice the size. It's 38 by 76 millimeter. Uh, while the Lynx Eye detector is, uh, is a bit smaller. It's uh, 16 by 14 by 4 millimeters uh, in size. Um, the Lynx Eye, let's say the XCT, for example, has a, an ex excellent energy resolution um, uh, below 380 electron volts for copper radiation. So that way, it is uh, really a um, really a, a ideal detector for for powder diffraction. The Iger detector is uh, is really an all-around detector, really great for uh, materials research, uh, for uh, any application where you need a, a large area for doing, let's say, uh, texture measurements, stress measurements, uh, micro diffraction, where you uh, want to collect a large amount of data at one time. So uh, that's that's really where the two detectors would would would. Uh, uh, where you can differentiate between the two detectors. So, I guess to go off script a little bit, um, I'm going to throw a question in here, though, kind of in response. So, pixels and strips, right? I mean, link size, those are all based on this strip technology. And then the Igers, they're based on the pixel technology. Why, why do we have some detectors that are strips and other detectors that are pixels? Let's talk about that a little bit. So that was for me again. You? Have I stumped <laughs> you all? <laughs> so, yeah, so okay. Christina, please go ahead. No, there's um, one. Uh, some people have some trouble going into the stage, so I'm just uh, going to send them some uh, instructions. Sorry. You carry on. All right. Well, yeah, I guess we'll have that conversation. So strips, right? So, so strips really allow better energy discrimination, right, Michael? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. So um, then, yeah, you're able to you're able to uh, let's say distinguish between an event hitting uh, on one strip or its neighboring strip a lot a lot easier than you can say on a uh, a pixel detector. Yeah, and so there's this this thing. It's a phenomenon. We're not going to go that into depth. It's very complex, but it's called charge sharing, right? Right. Right. Yeah. So. So charge sharing, company. yes. This this can no. be this can be let's say a a, a bigger um, have a bigger effect on a, a pixel detector because a pixel will have more neighbors than uh, a strip. A strip will have a maximum of two neighbors. A pixel can have 
let's say if you have a square pixel, you have uh, nine neighbors. So in that yeah. case, uh, charge sharing can be a, a, let's say, have a bigger effect on, on a pixel detector. And if you were to actually look at energy, right, as a function of count rate, what you're going to see in those plots is with, uh, with detectors due to charge sharing, you get this tail, right? And as you go to a pixel detector, some of that kind of, it's not as good. So in general, strip detectors, much better at energy discrimination. Pixel detectors, on the other hand, now what are the inherent advantages to pixel detectors? Well, in a pixel detector, you are, you have a, uh, let's say a greater spatial resolution. So you're able to um, collect, collect a photon and let's say it's spatial information over a two-dimensional space. Whereas a pixel detector, you're collecting uh, a photon if it hits on this part of the pixel, the sensor on the strip or on this part of the strip. It's it's information all going to the same strip. Yeah. And Christina, it looked like you had something to interject here too. Yeah, it's um, the, the, the other thing which we maybe want to touch on is the count rate actually, which is count rate capability, which is much higher on the on the pixel detectors. So if you're looking at thin film applications um, where you need the high count rate, the pixel detector will give you the opportunity to measure your data, for example, without any absorbers. And with the link side, you may have to use uh, some of these copper folds in between to, to get good data and statistics. Yeah. And, and those effects, though, are th these are just intrinsic to the technology, right? I mean, on the one hand, the count rate really comes from the increased number of counting channels per unit area. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. that, and yeah, the energy resolution really comes from the opposite effect, which is having larger coverage area, therefore less charge sharing. Yeah. So yeah. So and that's why that's why ask, um, people what they have, what they are currently using. Right. We've got uh, a bunch of people in the stage, so maybe we can just uh, find out who has a pixel detector and who has a strip detector. It could be interesting to to know where we are. Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's we'll throw a poll up just like that. So uh, we'll put it in here. Which detector type? And we're going to put in uh, Lynx Eye. So if you have a strip detector, maybe it's not called the Lynx Eye. You could still call that. I'll even label that strip versus. And then we'll add another option. We'll call this one um, Iger type. Many of you may not have the Iger yet, but if you have a something like an Iger, uh, we'll call that Pixel. And let's see what everybody has. So right now, if you want, go ahead and click on the polls. And in the poll area, you can click on which type that you currently have. So I'm actually quite fortunate. Right back there, uh, I have the Iger. <laughs> I, guess I, I guess I can also say I have the Iger as well, right? That's right. I have it right behind me as well. Yeah, so we're going to bias that poll a little bit. <laughs> Christina has all the Igers since she's the product manager. <laughs> yeah. All right. So it's actually looking about a 50-50 split right now. Um, so not surprised, actually. Uh, I mean, 2D has been around for quite a while. Um, so let's see here. Let's go to the next question. So... This is a great question. Somebody submitted it uh, anonymously. If you want, you can put your name there, and we'll uh, <laughs> we'll let everybody know. So, in the one-dimensional mode for the Iger, say say the 250 here. What is the two theta angular range simultaneously acquired by the detector? Okay, that's an excellent question. Should I should I take this one as well, Christina? If you like, I've got all the okay. numbers up here, but if you have them in your head. Maybe you can, yeah, maybe you can put the numbers up as well. Um, so this is going to, this will depend uh, strongly on where the detector is positioned relative to the sample. So the closer the detector is to the sample, the larger, the solid angle is going to be collected at one time. Uh, so when we're at say 100 millimeters from the sample, uh, we can collect something like 40 degrees in two theta, am I close? Well, at 100, with the 250, yeah. you get 20. With the 500, you get 40. Okay, with the, excuse me, with the 500K. With the 250K, it'll be around 20 degrees. Um, as you go further away, let's say if you go to 
400 or even 500 millimeters away from the sample, uh, then of course the solid angle collected is going to be much smaller. Uh, and in that case, we're talking, uh, this one I don't have memorized, so I'm going to need Four your help. To five. <laughs> Four to five. Four to five. Okay. Four to five, yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is a, <clears throat> this is, will depend strongly on where the detector is positioned relative to the sample. Yeah. And I think this yeah. is one of the, the great strengths, really, of, of the Eiger detector, that we can really move it in close to capture a large proportion of the diffraction pattern in a single shot. And I think if you want to do non-ambient really quickly, look at some in situ stuff, that's exactly what you want to do. You want to get close to capture the, right. the maximum diffraction angle in a single shot. I think also for thin film, it can be interesting to, to be quite close, right, John? Oh, absolutely. I mean, for thin film analysis, uh, having access to both technologies, that 0D, uh, the 1D, and the 2D is important because we want to see everything in the beginning of our analysis. So uh, back before I worked here at Brooker, I was a thin film grower. And, you know, when you're a thin film grower, a little bit of it is luck and science, and mad science-ness. Um, you sit there and you dial temperature gauges and you might turn up a flux here and uh, adjust the vacuum valve there, maybe leak something in and you're trying to grow something. And uh, to be quite honest, in the beginning stages of epi growth, mm, you don't know. It's a lot of luck. But one thing you can always rely on, and I always did, was having a 2D detector where I could take that sample, throw it in, and get an instant shot, not only of the phases that were present, but also their morphology and relative orientation. And once I had that information, then the great thing is you know which samples to go to the next step, which is to do that high res analysis, where we're going to take point scans with zero D detector and um, dial in lattice parameters. But you can waste so much time looking for peaks if you're just hunting in reciprocal space with zero D mode on a bad sample. Um, so now 40 degrees. So you guys mentioned 40 on the 500, right? And of course, 20 on the, um, on the 250. But 40 is a little bit of a magic number out there for some industries, right? Yeah, I mean, if you look at normal powder diffraction, I guess that's a lot. Maybe some people would measure from, I don't know, 10 to 50 degrees. If you do powder diffraction, maybe 20 to 60, something like this. So you can actually capture most of the information in a, in a single shot. And yeah, farm. <clears throat> pharma, though, right? For pharma, capturing that zone in a single shot is a very unique advantage, right? Especially if you so, think about high throughput mapping, sort of screening large sets of samples, indeed. Yeah, that's 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 one thing that we've seen a huge resurgence in, right, in the pharmaceutical industry is that uh, shotgunning approach, right, to sample preparation with HTS. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, capturing 40 degrees, so, you know, as close to zero as you can get all the way up to 40, absolutely essential there. Um, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really common measurement range. I think from, I think from two to 40 degrees is a very often asked for uh, measurement range from the, from the pharma industry. Yeah. yeah. So now, another thing that really struck me when I first started using the Iger detectors, and especially the integration that Brooker did, um, is that we're no longer capturing two-dimensional data, though, in shots, right? We're no longer going, bam, take a picture, bam, take a picture, bam, take a picture. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Now, with uh, if you can collect 2D, 2D data while scanning, that's a really big advantage. Because, like you mentioned, if you're doing, let's say, a snapshot, a 2D snapshot, your tube is fixed, or your source is fixed, and your detector is fixed then your sampling, whatever your, your, your sample, uh, you're only correcting one set of orientations. So the amount of information you get is much less than if you can actually scan. And that's a big advantage if you can scan with a 2D detector, is then if you're moving your source and detector simultaneously, you are sampling much more of your, of your sample. You're collecting more of the, uh, of the crystallites in different, uh, different orientations. That's a, that's a huge advantage. So, and in that regards, the, um, now the five, the 250 is a square, right? So when we scan that, it's gonna scan as a square, but the 500 is actually rectangular. So 
which way should we use it maybe when we're doing scanning versus snapshot modes? I mean, so, I mean, sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's okay. I, uh, so yeah, that'll, that'll largely depend on, on what you're, what you're trying to do. If you want to collect as much 2d or th let's say two theta information at once, um, and then you want to orient your rectangular sensor such that the long edge is going along two theta. Then you can collect as much two theta information at one time. If you want to do a, a 2D scan, then if you orient the detector like so, where your long axis is going in this direction, in the gamma direction, then you can collect a lot more in gamma and scan in two theta. So then you're still collecting all that information in two theta, but you're also capturing a much larger piece of, of, of gamma as well. And being asymmetric is actually quite an advantage, what I've found, is that because it minimizes the defocusing effects then. Since you're capturing a narrower two theta region, as you scan that and build it up, you're able to keep everything in that scanned image in focus. So That's true. That's true. So let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Um, so what kind of maintenance do we have to do on the instrument to ensure that we are always getting uh, trustworthy data, that we're getting very precise values? That was a question that had come in. Yeah. I thought it was quite an interesting um, question. And I guess it's really a multifaceted um, question, really. I guess you have the detector. But you have to, of course, look at the entire instrument if you want to ensure that your data is um, precise and accurate and that your results are trustworthy. And one thing which we generally recommend um, to our users is to, to use the corundum standard that we deliver with the instrument to measure that repeatedly and, and actually check um, if the peaks are in the right position, if the intensities are OK. And that would be one way just to do like a daily check, for example, and, and confirm that the instrument is still well aligned. But then when it comes to the detector, I think what's interesting is the, uh, maybe for the detector side, especially for in the light of other pixel detectors, is the flood field corrections or the maybe the, the bad pixels which are occurring. And I mean, you guys are using it um, daily in the lab. So what's your experience? I mean, for me, it's it's been, the biggest change has actually been no maintenance. So using past detector technologies where I might have to do a flood field, I might have to do a, a spatial alignment, anything like this on a routine basis. With these detectors, you just turn it on. I want a different distance. It calculates those corrections. You know, you do it at two two values and I can hit put the detector anywhere I want. Um, so... I mean, in fact, my favorite system, like of any system out there, I'm a little biased, right? I mean, come on here, I'm <laughs> that broker, right? But I love the system that has no maintenance, which is a micro focus on the primary side, the Iger on the secondary side, and there is nothing, absolutely nothing uh, that you have to do to it. It just works. That is a nice system. That is, yeah. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit jealous with that. Uh, <laughs> Well, then again, for powder machines, though, like the one behind you, Mike, I mean, you can't beat Bright Brentano for straight no, up. No, 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 for sure, for sure. When it comes to when it comes to powder, when it comes to powder uh, for powder measurements, uh, a sealed tube system and an Iger, I mean, the the, the maintenance is is also also extremely low. Um, I mean, you you have to swap out your X-ray tube after a couple of years if you if you see that the, the intensity is going down a bit. Um, you want to swap out an X-ray tube. Uh, but really, it's uh, yeah, it's also really very, very low maintenance, uh, especially in the detector side. So, switching the topic, but still talking about swapping X-ray tubes, we had a couple of questions coming in um, about uh, fluorescence filtering, mm -hmm. and one is asking if you have a cobalt tube or a copper tube, um, how does the Iger um, filter K-beta? Is it comparable to the link size? And then in a similar um, kind of direction, how do we handle fluorescence on the, or how is the fluorescence handled on the Iger compared to the lynx eye? And they suppose that the lynx eye does the better job at handling the fluorescence. 
John, you touched a bit on that earlier when you talked about the energy resolution of strip detectors, which is superior to the energy resolution of pixel detectors. Maybe you want to, to come back to that. Hey, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. So, yep, energy fluoresce or it, getting rid of that energy fluorescence is definitely something that sits in the, um, the link site category as optimal. Now, that being said, that's because it's exceptional at doing that. But the Iger is actually also very good at reducing fluorescence in the background uh, because it uses a, a solid state detector, detection method. So it has that big, thick chunk of silicon. We get great absorption with high energy. Uh, and at low energy, we have just the right absorption that we don't introduce a lot of noise. Um, what that means is photon comes in directly converted to an energy value. And now we can sort it out. And we're talking... I mean, Christina, I'm going to point to you and say, what is it, a thousand EV about? For the Iger? Yeah. I think it's actually a little bit better than that. But a yeah. little bit better than that. So if we were using copper radiation, we're looking at an iron sample, this is going to take out that fluorescence effects, right? Now, we go to cobalt. Cobalt, first of all, it's going to take out any issues with iron generally. It's going to really reduce the background. It's a great all-around radiation because it has nice wavelength, very similar to copper, but energy is slightly lower to reduce any of that fluorescence. Now with the K-beta, because the energy is a little bit lower, um, and the beta and the alpha then are a little bit closer, it's a little trickier to get rid of that K-beta. But that being said, the Lynx XET is able to remove it, um, the K-beta, without a problem, and also the, the energy fluorescence. So, you know, if it was me, I would say, if I was doing battery research with cobalt materials all day long, I really might think about going with that Linksight XET to get rid of, of the background, right? Um, if, on the other hand, I was looking at something like Molly radiation, so I had more punching power through my battery cells, um, I, would, I would probably consider going to the Iger. And in the ideal world, I'd probably <clears throat> get one of each. <laughs> <laughs> if only. Yeah. Well, that's one of the nice things about these machines, though. It's not a problem, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, I have uh, on the system, the system behind me, I have both detectors inside. And uh, I mean, you, you can swap between the two of them in an, a minute, less than a minute. Yeah. Yeah. But certainly, I think this is with detectors, the reason we have a multitude of them is that it's right tool, right job. Right. Definitely. So right to right job. I think we also sometimes we had some people asking um, how is the Iger for for single crystal um, applications, and of course that's a kind of interesting question. Um, I would say it's it's a pixel detector, so in principle you can use it for single crystal di um, diffraction. Uh, we at Brooker we have our own let's say range of detectors for, for single crystals. Uh, the, the photon detectors, which are on our D8 Quest and uh, Venture diffractometers. And the IGA is on our XRD, um, D8 Advanced and D8 Discover diffractometers. And the reason we have the IGA on the XRD diffractometers is because it's so versatile. You can use it for powder, you can use it for stress, you can use it for SACs, uh, for pair distribution functional analysis, and you can move it close, you can move it far away. So it's a really nice multi-purpose tool. On single crystal, you're probably more looking for a really dedicated detector that you can bring really close to your sample, have small pixels, high absorption, even for maybe very hard radiation, which is less routinely used in XRD. So as you said, John, it's the right uh, tool for the, for the different jobs. And I think the IGAS is a great tool for X-ray diffraction. Yeah, in the case of SCD, probably one of the best um, metaphors that I've heard comes from... Uh, Roger Durst, uh, head of our SCD group, and you know he talked. To, he, he was talking about how it's kind of like a window, and for SCD, they're looking out at a starry night through that window. And you imagine if you were to put a screen on the window where it has a whole bunch of very very narrow wires, you have the possibility of blocking some of those tiny itty little bitty reflections. And in that case, that's very very uh, hurtful to the analysis. Um, and that's why for SCD, they want to have something more monolithic like that CMOS sensor uh, of the photon. But like you said, for XRD, we tend to be more utilitarian. We want to have many different jobs that we can do. 
And it's more like looking out that window and seeing a nice sunny day uh, where we're maybe looking at the tree in our yard or we're looking at a big rainbow in the sky, like our Dubai rings, right? Where it's okay to have, you know, a little bit of that, that sectioning. And in response to that, every single pixel is a little bit more precise in its energy and, and things like that. So let's see here. I think we had answered the two questions that came in about energy resolution, right? Okay, so let's check our next question here. All right, how about some acquisition times? This is a great question. So uh, acquisition times with 1D and we could even say with 2D, with 0D. What has been the change here? So back in the day, back in the day, I'm kind of old so I can say that. Back in the day, <laughs> I used to collect for hours and sometimes overnight. Is that where we're still at? Definitely not. Definitely not. Um, so acquisition time, uh, this is always a tough question to answer. My favorite answer is always, it depends. It's going to depend on a lot of things. It's going to depend on the sample. It's going to depend on what you want. What information do you want to get out of the sample? Um, but typically oh, now. On. Stop batting around the bush. Give us it, an answer. You want a number, huh? You just want a hard number. <laughs> well, uh, some number. Is it minutes? Yeah. Is it hours? Is it days? What are we talking about? Yeah, here? we're talking. So, I mean, we're talking now about even seconds. Uh, if you want to get, let's say, we talked earlier about uh, collecting a large collection of two theta at once. Let's say you want to collect um, uh, an in, 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 uh, in operando measurement, you want to collect a large two theta uh, bit of information. Um, you can collect data every few seconds, even. Um, so we're talking anywhere from seconds to, I mean, if we're talking uh, uh, data necessary for structure refinement, structure solution, we're talking more in the hours. But um, yeah, now it, it, it's an orders of magnitude faster than it was uh, back in your day, John. <laughs> <laughs> now, that being said, I mean, there is times when you collect longer. I mean, I, I know from the film's perspective, uh, to me, when you have dynamic range like the Iger, so you can count very high. Right. But also, sometimes low is important. I mean, when, when I want to collect signal that's ranging on a substrate peak, few million counts per second to background oscillations that are just 0 0.1, 0 0.01 counts per second. And I want to be able to map that out over a very long time. I've done that over three days. And now if we compare that in the past, that was not possible, period. So you can still collect long if you want. But. Right. But yeah, I, I would say probably really order of minutes for assessing samples. Uh, like Michael said, if we're doing battery type work in operando or temperature work or heating it up just a few seconds. Um, and it's really quick to change between the modes too. Right. Um, right. Let's see here. Yeah, for a, for a stand, yeah, standard measurement, a few minutes. All right. So we have a very specific question. I think this is the last one in this sheet. It's is the detector suitable for respirable crystalline silica samples? Yeah. Does it offer I mean, the same sensitivity or improved? <laughs> I mean, I would say that maybe for those of you who are not so familiar with this application, uh, it's used to look at uh, silica in the air we breathe, especially if you're working in, an, in a workplace, maybe in a mining setting where it's quite dusty. And the reason we monitor the, the silica is because it can actually cause lung cancer and silicosis. So we want to limit our exposure to, to the fine particles. So we collect air samples on a filter and then we measure those filter samples in our diffractometer. And we use something called, uh, we use a, here we use the quant and the calibration method to determine how much silica is in the air. And what you want is you want a really nice low background and you want to measure relatively quickly because probably you have to go through different samples from different monitoring stations. Uh, now, I just checked again our, our lab report and with the Linksa XCT, we are looking at measurement times of around one minute to go to, I think, 50 micron. 
uh, microgram um, concentration. So with the IGA, you could potentially push down that measurement time a little bit more or increase your sensitivity. But I would say at one minute measurement time, you're going to be preparing samples a lot slower than the instrument right. will measure the, the filter. Also keep in mind that maybe you have other minerals present in, in, in there and they could cause fluorescence. So I would say for such a specific application, the link size is actually a very good fit. All right. So we had another question come in here. Uh, is the Iger detector temperature sensitive as the Linksci XCT? Any problems with humidity? Um, I know the Linksci XCT has to be cooled, otherwise it can be damaged. That's a question from Yoan. So is it, as, yeah. is it temperature sensitive? Okay, so the, the question with the temperature sensitivity, right? Well, no detector likes to be uh, humid. I think they all want to be uh, operated in non-condensing conditions. So it's the really the condensing of liquid, of, of water, which is an issue. Um, so maybe you can tell us where you are. I wonder if you're maybe somewhere where the environment is, is quite uh, humid. Uh, then I would definitely recommend an air conditioning system in the lab. With regards to the temperature, um, what you should know is that the energy resolution is a function of the temperature for all semiconductor detectors. Um, so you can operate the detector in a certain temperature band, and the hotter the detector is, the worse your energy resolution. This is the same for all um, semiconductor de type detector. And it has gotten a lot better. Um, there used to be these uh, lithium drifted silicon detector types where uh, the only way to get good energy resolution was you had to make this very specifically, it was a doped silicon crystal, which was then back doped with lithium. Uh, very, very tedious process, took months to grow the crystals. Then you had to seal that into a tiny vacuum chamber and put it on a, a cooling head. And uh, that thing had to stay actively pumped, even when you were shipping it. If you uh, didn't plug in the battery, that detector was dead after about a day. Uh, and that's all because of the cleanliness of the silicon. Um, you know, like Christina said, it's all about charge carriers. And as you increase temperature in a semiconductor, you're going to increase the number of spurious carriers. Thankfully, nowadays, we are so much better at creating silicon in a clean state uh, and in a controlled state so that we don't have as much of a temperature sensitivity um, as what we had a long time ago. So. Of course, XET, because it's so sensitive to, temp or to energy resolution, that's where that temperature comes in. And the best thing is, you know, recalibrate it. Talk, call our service department. They can walk you through a recalibration if you are at a different temperature um, where it's been at. And maybe one more thing to, to mention is um, when people talk about cooling, they might mean completely different things. So air cooling could be, could be one thing. But keep in mind, some detectors actually need water cooling. And yeah. neither the link site nor the IGA need water cooling. And that is really important. You don't want these water pipes hanging around in your instrument, moving when your detector is moving. Um, yeah. If you have a leak, then you've got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, water is one of those, like, it's my arch nemesis in the lab setting. I always feel like if a leak can happen, it's going to happen under my watch. I don't know why. But <laughs> it's never a good feel, especially here we have carpet in the lab. And I remember quite a few days where I'd walk in and be like, oh, the carpet feels a little wet. <laughs> Not a good thing. So, um, you know, one more question I have. I'm going to throw it out there because I think a lot of people are wondering. Um, and unless anybody else throws something in, maybe this will be the last one. Mm -hmm. So why the 250? I mean, the 500... It's got that larger sensor. This one basically is about the same, just a, a little bit smaller square sensor. Why? Why did we do it? Well, that's a question for me, I guess, John. <laughs> I think that's a question for you. <laughs> well, I would say for me, the main reason is that the IGA was really a tremendous success. You love it. Our customers love it. It's fantastic because you can do everything with this detector, really all applications. And I think this is really nice also if you are in a 
multi-user environment, or if you have to share the instrument between different groups, you have to have that flexibility. And with the IGA 250, we first of all make that technology available to many more users, simply because of the smaller form factor is more accessible to, to people. And secondly, um, there's a bunch of applications where you don't need that huge size. You may want to have the pixels with their high count rate capability for the, for the thin film applications. Um, you may want to have a pixel detector for maybe for texture analysis, but you might not need the full blown 500K detector. Um, the other where, reason where you might want to go for the 250 instead of the 500K is when your applications are mostly scanning type applications. So you're going to cover that two theta range anyway by a scan. Um, so you're going to do the scan anyway. You will get better statistics, of course, with the larger detector, but it's not you're not dependent on the single uh, snapshot coverage like um, you would maybe if you were close in for some applications. So I would say, yeah, make it more accessible, right size detector for a certain type of applications. Um, that would be the, the two main reasons. Yeah, yeah, as a thin film grower, that was the big thing to me was, like you said, I don't always use the whole size. I mean, when I'm doing 0D measurements, uh, when I want to do epi stuff, even GID, uh, in-plane GID, which we've been doing a lot of, I want to have the ability to use no absorber. I mean, why make photons if I'm going to throw them away, right? Um, I want to have that high dynamic range, but if I'm not going to use the big range, the big size of it, you know, really it's, it's that ideal size. Um, and it's large enough. I can still do fast RSMs. I can do, um, you know, fast other measurements or in my lab, if, you know, somebody's bringing in a powder, if somebody's bringing in other samples, I have all of that capability. Um, it's just at a much more accessible point, I think for everyone. All right, so I think, oh, we did have one more question come in, so I think we're going to get to that one now. Or, nope, I think we're good. I think that is all the questions. Um, so, Christina, Michael, did you guys have anything else that you wanted to put out there for everybody? Not, no, no, not from my side. Yeah, I'm certainly... If you are considering, if you have any other questions, please feel free to get in touch with us uh, anytime. We will not respond in the middle of the night, but we will get back to you uh, as soon as we can. Um, of course, you can come uh, either virtually or maybe in the future in person and, and watch the IGA in action in our labs. Um, Michael and, and John, for example, would be quite happy to show you all the ins and outs and, and measure data for you. And if you want to learn more uh, about the IGA, please do visit our website, uh, broker.com. Um, if you, yeah, or get in touch directly with your sales team. There we go. So um, thanks everybody for joining. Like Christina said, if you are interested, I really do encourage you to contact us about uh, setting up a virtual demo. We do have some really, really nice studio equipment um, so we're able to kind of convey to you, I think in a very high quality manner, um, these solutions, uh, even in these times. So uh, definitely contact us and uh, let us know your questions and, and let us help you out in terms of uh, figuring out if these are the right solutions. So um, thanks everybody for joining and have a wonderful day or a wonderful evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Okay. All right. Goodbye, Thank everyone. Bye-bye.